All right, I'm just going to take my three socks. I warmed up nicely. Okay, I've been interested in UFOs since I was about 10 years of age, after I saw Cloak and Cat of the Third Kind, the Spielberg film. I suspect many of you have seen it. Um, after that point, I started going to the library, reading a lot of books on the subject. Um, back then, there was no internet, so all you had was a few books in the library with a few black and white spotted photos in. Um, but you had lots of written accounts of UFOs, and at the time, I did find them quite inspiring and it sort of kept my research going and kept my interest going in the subject. Um, when I was about 20, I read Above Top Secret by Tim Good. I suspect many have read that book, and that sort of uh, magnified my interest in the subject once again, and I started subscribing to UFO magazine, which I'm sure many of you read, and I started reading a lot of the American literature, um, which has been produced over the last few decades. Um, in 1995, I attended a conference by UFO magazine, and Bob Dean was one of the speakers, and as part of his talk, he showed some historical artworks which appeared to show UFOs in them. Um, you're going to see some of those shortly, and that really got me interested in UFOs from an historical perspective. If UFOs are flying around today, I've always had this feeling that they've probably been flying around for thousands of years, and Obviously, 95% how can be explained as natural phenomenon, meteors, birds, comets, and so forth. I think these are probably the sorts of things that Andy has, has touched on and is interested in. But there remains a sort of a small percentage which are unexplainable and may have an ET hypothesis. And so, if that core of 5% is flying around today, I think there's a good chance that they've been flying around for thousands of years and have left their mark in the world's religions, in various tribal beliefs. Um, written accounts and in illustrations as well. So I'll just bring up the first slide. This is the uh, section for my talk. Um, I'm going to start off looking at UFOs in prehistory. This has been the domain of Von Daniken. I'm sure you all know that name. Um, basically, images of UFOs on cave walls. The second section are actual historical UFO sightings. These are actual written accounts of UFOs, and the ones I'm showing you today have an actual illustration of the actual site, and many of these illustrations were done at the time. Um, they go back to about 200 BC, and I've got some going up to about 1780 today. Um, there is one research who's catalogued about 1500 sightings before 1900 of UFOs. Now again, many of them are going to be natural phenomena, but there may be a core which do have an easy hypothesis. So. Yeah, I think it's important to have, at least have a look at them rather than just disregard it all as, as meteors and everything that's explainable. The third section I'm going to look at is UFOs in religious art. This is quite a contentious subject area. Um, many uh, or most art historians would tend to say that any UFO or UFO-like UFO objects in artwork is purely religious allegory. Uh, my question is, if they're painting UFO-like objects in artworks, what does it say about the text that they're basing their interpretation on? Are there flying objects in the Bible and other religious matter? <coughs> the last section looks at the early UFO photographs. I came up with the idea of cataloguing early UFO photographs prior to Roswell and Kenneth Arnold's sighting in 1947 when modern ufology um, was supposed to have begun. I'm trying to illustrate the point that people have been seen and photographing UFOs prior to that year. Um, so let's crack on with the first section. In 1983, an anthropologist named Mary Leakey brought out a book called Africa's Vanishing Art, and she concentrated on the cave paintings of northern Tanzania. And this is an example from her book. This has been looked at by Spanish researcher J.J. Benitez, and he noticed some curious anomalies in some of these artworks. We're all used to seeing uh, hunting scenes in ancient artworks, prehistory artworks on cave walls, bison, spears, men hunting animals. But there are several examples with what appear to be hat-shaped objects or flying saucers. Whether these are actual alien spacecraft, we'll never know, but it's certainly worth the examination anyway. A lot of orthodoxy um, scientific, what members of the scientific community, the orthodoxy, would tend to state that these are examples of shamanism, 
where the artist would go into an altered state of consciousness and they'd start seeing weird symbols and that sort of thing and, and then they'd depict them on cave walls. Well, that may be the case with a lot of them, but is it, is it the answer for all of them? This is an example from a cave from some France, dated to about 15,000 BC, and in the box highlighted, that's not an alien, that's actually a man that's been speared. I'll show you the actual photo in a minute. But just in front of him, you can see a number of curious geometric objects, and there are a few dotted around the image, as you can see as a whole. You've got your typical uh, bison and animals and spears, but then you've got these strange geometric objects which don't really seem in keeping in context with what's um, going on there. There's a close-up of the object, and you can see some of the strange geometric forms that were painted on those cave walls. And this is part of the actual uh, wall face where you can see the figure he's been speared, and just above him you can see the sort of curious UFO-like object. Now maybe it might be some sort of strange depiction of an animal, you know, we may never know, but um, it's, it's worth noting that there are these sort of UFO-like objects cropping up in these ancient paintings, they're not purely uh, bison and spears. A French researcher um, spent some time looking at these caves in southern France and drew up a chart of a lot of the different geometric symbols and um, images that cropped up. And just take a look through them there, you can see some classic UFO-like shapes. If you look at number, if you look at Look at that one there, you've got a classic UFO shape and you've also got some dots underneath, maybe that's indicating some sort of energy force emanating off the object. You've got another one down here with what appears to be a figure underneath and some classic uh, UFO type shapes there. So, you know, the question is, what were these artists depicting back then, many thousands of years ago? There's an example of one of the uh, objects that was painted on the walls, which I pointed out to you earlier. A lot of people wonder um, what is the oldest piece of artwork that exists, not just in UFOs, but in general. Traditionally, it was some examples from southern France, which were dated to about 32,000 BC. But in the last few years, there's been some other examples of older artwork which have rewritten the rule book. In Africa, in some caves in Africa, two pieces of ochre have been found with geometric symbols on them, sort of zigzaggy lines, and they've been dated to about 70,000 BC. And within the last couple of weeks, some of you may have seen on the BBC News internet website that two rocks have been found in Italy by an archaeologist and, and they appear to have faces that have been sculpted into them. And this archaeologist feels that they're about 150,000 BC. Um, the sceptics tend to say that they're just purely formed by geological processes. They weren't artificially made at all. Um, also as well, several years ago in Morocco, a stone figure was found, and that's been it to 400,000 BC. So it's almost like astronomy in many other subjects. Something gets discovered, and the rule book gets rewritten. Um, so at the moment, the, the official um, age for the oldest piece of artwork found is about 80,000 BC. Here's an example from Brazil. You can just make out a sort of classic dome-shaped object that's been depicted on that wall. People, another question people ask is, well, how are these? objects dated. Well, they can do it several ways. They can do it by analysing the soil, the, sorry, the, the erosion of the rock on the, on the face of the, of the wall. But also, they often find um, tools, bones, bits of paraphernalia around the objects on the ground, and that can be carbon dated. So they can get an idea then of, of the time span involved. This is an example from Mexico. I'm not going to try and pronounce the name. That's one of the pitfalls with this subject. You've got lots of unpronounceable names and things, and uh, it's very difficult on a, on, a, on a public stage to try and pronounce them correctly, so I'm not going to do that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, that could be the sun, it might be a UFO, we don't know, but um, you can see the artist has painted some objects on the, on the actual object itself, some sort of small, maybe they're sunspots, maybe they're portholes of UFOs. And you can also see there's like an energy field around the object as well. And the figures below have got their arms outstretched. To, maybe the artist is trying to show some relationship between the object and the people. These are two images from uh, the American Southwest, uh, dated to 2000 BC. I don't think they're jellyfish. They look uh, more like UFOs than jellyfish. Um, there is a tale from one tribe uh, from America where they talk of a craft coming down. Actually, I think it glided, two craft glided and one of them came down and it was structurally damaged. Then another craft appeared, repaired that one, and they both flew off. 
Uh, that's one of many strange tales from uh, historical times where you, where you hear about, you read about UFOs cropping up. This is a nice example from British Columbia. Uh, this is in a book by John Mager that came out in the late 70s. I think it's called Alien Visitors. And you can see you've got, you've got a sort of object with what appear to be um, landing legs below it. And either side, you've got some figures. And in a minute, you'll see the tracing. There you go, there's a better, there's a better detail of the object. Now, um, you know, what on earth could that be? You know, that's 1000 BC. You can see how the object's been depicted so it's larger than the figures as well. The figures are smaller in relation to the object. The two at the top are from British Columbia again, and the one at the bottom is from uh, an area from Russia. You can see the similarity, the cross correspondence between the two, how you've got figures in objects. And the one from Coors Creek has got sort of wavy lines below it, as if the artist was trying to indicate some sort of movement. The one at the bottom is from um, Chariots of the Girls by Von Daniken, which uh, was quite a big bestseller in its day. There's another example from uh, British Columbia. Again, you've got these wavy lines below. Now, as well as objects, strange objects, you also get strange figures. And again, this is quite a contentious area. Um, the orthodox viewpoint on these things is that they're just depictions of humans in ritual costume or their shamanic drawings, whereby the individual goes into an altered state of consciousness and sees strange beings and then puts them on cables. That may be the case in, in all examples. Or it could be that maybe some of these are extraterrestrials from thousands of years ago. Um, you can see that they're sort of surrounded with like a halo or some sort of some headpiece and they appear to be carrying some sort of implements as well. There are many written accounts, many stories in many tribes and religions around the world of beings appearing on the scene, often with supernatural powers, instructing the locals and then disappearing or ascending back into the sky at a later date. Are these purely fiction? I mean, when they're occurring geographically all around the world, it does make you wonder whether there is something to them. Here's another one from Africa. This one's actually 18 feet high, and this one's depicted with one eye, as you can see. And there's an actual account, I think, in an old issue of Flying Saucer Review, of some what appeared to be extraterrestrial beings with one eye. So whether this was an example, and the artist actually saw one firsthand, who knows? It appears to have four fingers as well. The example on the left is from Nazca. Many of you are familiar with the Nazca lines. Well, there's, there's also a few, um, well, there's many animal depictions in Nazca, and there's also a few uh, anthropomorphic figures as well. I've brought these two slides up because they illustrate a little cross correspondence you can get in different parts of the world. You notice that they've both got antennae on their heads, um, they've both got round eyes, and they've both got slightly oversized footwear as well. So I thought there's some sort of similarities there from different parts of the world. The one on the left, I think, is about 20 metres high. It's quite, quite a large object. OK, that's a, a little taster of prehistory artwork of UFOs and maybe some of the occupants. Um, I'm now going to go on to actual UFO accounts. These are probably the most powerful bit of evidence of UFOs in ancient times. The example I'm going to show you now actually have an illustration of the UFO as well. And there are many thousands of historical sightings going back before the time of Christ, and a number of these have illustrations. This one is from 1783. Uh, the guy that illustrated this is Thomas Stanby, who was actually a famous artist in his own right. He was fortunate to have this sighting, and basically a luminous oblong object was seen flying horizontally across the sky, and he and a number of observers observed it, and um, you can see the illustration he did after the event of witnessing the object. Remember, you know, this is before the Wright Brothers and man flight, so it certainly removes the idea that it was a manned object, a man flying object, that still leaves many other natural explanations, but uh, it's interesting all the same. This is an example which appeared in a prestigious um, piece of literature, the Royal Society for Philosophical Transactions, and he's, he's written his account here, and it occurred in London in 1742. The illustration at the bottom is the actual object, and I've got an artist's illustration in a minute of the actual colours um, that the guy witnessed. And the wavy line above is the motion of the object so as it flew across in front of him. And there's an actual illustration of the object. 
as he saw it, and range in lots of colours. This was sent to me by a researcher who read about the, uh, the sighting, and he decided to use artistic skills and sent this in to me. So it, it captures uh, the object quite nicely that the uh, individual saw. What you tend to find with historical sightings is you get a lot of crosses cropping up. There's a lot of um, written accounts of crosses in the sky. Maybe the powers that be are uh, trying to influence our religions or using religious iconography, who knows. But uh, there are plenty of written accounts of crosses occurring in uh, historical UFO accounts. These two are from China, not a well-known Christian country. This is one from uh, 1710, which occurred over London. Two night watchmen witnessed the object. You can see how the artist has used like a, a devil-like object in the top left-hand corner. Obviously, people back then are very, very superstitious, and they, they see these strange things in the sky, and they might sort of stylize the uh, the illustration a little by by using supernatural beings as well. This is one from uh, Hamburg in Germany, 1697. What's nice about this one is the artist has actually got some of the figures at the bottom looking at the objects as well. So the artist is indicating that people are looking at them. And two large silver shields were seen over Hamburg, Germany, back in that time. Makes you wonder what, what they must have thought at the time when they used to see things like that. I mean, it's, um, it's pretty amazing today if you get a good UFO sighting, but back then, well, how must have broken loose? But they were talking about it over many beers for many days. This is, uh, well it's either a French coin or a medal, it's minted in 1680 and you can see like a large wheel-like object in the sky and you've got the ground at the bottom, you've got the clouds above it. So the artist is depicted as an aerial object and you can see around its rim um, there's like a number of lights or portholes around the object and there's like a centrepiece which sticks out, emanates from the middle. It's almost like a, like a merry-go-round wheel and uh, there are accounts of wheel-like objects today that have been seen so maybe Whoever minted this saw had a sighting back then, or he had a very imaginative mind. These are two objects from 1670. Another one you get cropping up, crop, cropping up quite often are sort of flying planks of wood or girders. You'll see another example which is quite similar to this um, from several hundred years earlier. And again, you've got a couple of people at the, at the bottom looking up at the object, and up in the clouds you've got like an army. So again, this is a supernatural feeling to this one where people were witnessing these objects and they were wondering what they, they were, maybe it was like a, an army from heaven or, or, or some, uh, some, nasty, some nasty omen from, from God or something. This is uh, quite an interesting sighting that occurred off the coast of southern France in 1608. This is uh, a relatively modern illustration but it captures what happened. The illustration was done by uh, a French UFO group some several decades ago and basically one day several UFOs were sighted off the shore, off the coastline, and they hovered over, over the shore. And the locals were obviously quite scared and worried, so that the local army brought in their cannons and started firing um, artillery shells, or cannonballs I should say, at the objects. Um, they didn't budge, no damage done. And later on you'll read of an account, you hear of an account from 1942 where the same thing happened over the skies of LA. Um, basically the objects hovered there for quite a while. Um, in the text that I've read, which is in my book, um, it mentions this horrible sort of screaming noise that the objects made as well. So you've got a visual and a, sort of a sonic aspect in that case. And there were several sightings at around the time of August um, on different dates in, in, in Genoa and Nice. Um, so that, that's quite, quite a fascinating account that is. Um, the actual manuscript of this lies in some French uh, civic hall. I can't remember where it is now, but um, it's mentioned in my book. And I did actually have a photocopy of the French which someone translated for me. I've got the English translation in my book, and um, it does make for quite fascinating reading. And you know, if it's purely fiction, and people back then were obviously quite creative in, the, in their, their way of thinking. This is one some of you might see from Switzerland. It's a woodcut done by Hans Glasser. It uh, resides in the Zurich Library, and a number of large black balls were seen over the skies of Basel or Baal, depending on your point of view. Here's another one, from, this one's from uh, Nuremberg in Germany. Uh, initially, a number of shapes were seen in the sky, crosses, tubes, um, and it appears from the description they were having some sort of battle, and there was a lot of smoke, and the objects fell to the ground, so you, can, you can see some smoke at the bottom, and then they all disappeared. 
And then following that, this large black spear-like object appeared on the scene. I know it's not triangular, but I, I do kind of wonder whether it's like a, an ancient interpretation of one of the big black triangles that, that people see today in uh, modern UFO accounts. This is from uh, Arabia from 1479, and it's an illustration from a book by uh, Conrad Lycosteens. I think I pronounced his name correctly. He was uh, an ancient chronicler of things strange. He, was, uh, he brought out a sort of a reader's digest of the strange and bizarre back in the 15th century. I can't pronounce it, it's in Latin, the title of the book. Uh, but a, a, a large um, pointed beam recited over the skies of Arabia. And you see the artistic rendition of it. You can see it's kind of quite detailed as well. I said earlier um, in the illustration from France that you get these accounts of sort of flaming girders seen, and uh, this has a little bit of a similarity to the two from France. Uh, a large flaming girder, that's how it was exactly how it was described, was seen over the skies of Italy during the, the reign of King Enrico VI. These are two illustrations from a 13th century manuscript and they refer to a sighting which took place at Sidibu Castle in 776 AD um, where Emperor Charlemagne um, was residing and the Saxons were trying to attack the castle and two large shields were seen in the sky. You often find in ancient UFO accounts because they couldn't use terms like spacecraft or UFO, they use metaphors like shields or dragons or chariots. And shields is one of those metaphors that you find probably quite a lot in ancient accounts of UFOs. Got some more crosses here. Um, this is from a 16th century manuscript. Uh, there was a war between the French, sorry, the Italians and the Swiss in 494 AD, and two crosses were seen. Again, it makes you wonder why they're cross-shaped. This is a sighting from Tarquinia, Tarquinia sorry, near Rome, 99 BC. Initially, a, a meteor was sighted in the, in the sky, and towards sunset, a large shield-like object was seen. You can see the shield depicted on the top left-hand side of the image, and there's two people at the bottom of the picture, bottom left-hand side of the pointing up pointing up at the object. This one's from Rome. Um, initially, a lightning struck that temple on the right hand side of the picture, and an ox was seen to levitate up into the sky. And after a period of the time, it, it just dropped out of the sky, and then ships were sighted in the sky above it. So you had several uh, anomalous phenomena going on there. Now, it could be that many of these are works of fiction, but there may be some of them aren't. As I say, UFOs are seen today, so why, why shouldn't they have been seen for thousands of years? Um, so maybe these accounts are genuine. Right, UFOs and religious artwork. There's a number of religious artworks which have what appear to be uh, UFOs in them. Are they pure, purely religious allegory, or are they something else? This is probably the most famous example. It's called the Madonna with Saint Giovannino. It resides in the Palazzo Vecchio in Italy. It was painted in the 16th century. Um, there's some confusion as to the artist, but it's considered to originate from the school of Lippi. And you know, it's a typical attractive religious painting. You've got Mary in the picture, you've got Jesus and Saint Giovannino below. And you've got some scenery in the background, some landscape, and to the right of Mary's head, you've got this strange dark object. And initially, it looks rather innocuous, it, you know, it could be anything. But when it's enhanced, you've got a little bit more detail. You've got a man and a dog at the bottom of the picture, they're looking up at the sky. Um, the man's got his hand over his brow, so the artist is trying to indicate the brightness which is emanating from the object. And if we enhance the object further, that's what you, that's what you see. Now, if you ask uh, a member of the artistic establishment, I'll just say that's a cloud or a stylized cloud, which it may be, but um, it does look remarkably like a flying saucer. And some people have gone further to state 
that you can just see sort of two black dots towards the top of the crop, they could be heads, I mean, I don't know, but um, certainly one of the more fascinating uh, objects which appear in religious artworks, and some people say, oh, that's just hoax, but it does actually, it is actually in the uh, building. I've had emails of people that have actually seen it first hand, so that's that one. This is the Annunciation by Carlo Carrasco, really. Um, it was painted in about 1600 uh, for a church in Ascoli in Italy. But eventually it made its way to the National Gallery in London where it now hangs. Um, you can see in the top left we've got a sort of UFO-like object shining a pencil beam of light down on Mary. Um, on the left you've got the angel Gabriel who's depicted with the wings and next to him is the mayor of, of Ascoli. It was painted to celebrate the um, freedom that Ascoli obtained. I think it had obtained some sort of autonomy from uh, central government, and uh, Carlo was commissioned to paint this picture. Uh, there are many annunciation pictures, but this is one of the more interesting ones because uh, it does show a UFO-like object. Now again, it could just be religious allegory, but why are these religious artists reading pieces of text, painting pictures based on their interpretation and having these UFO-like objects in them? A book was written in the late 60s called The Bible and Flying Sources by Reverend Downing, an excellent book, and he looked at the idea that there are UFOs in the Bible, if you, if, you, if you read between the lines. One of the examples he cites is when Moses is leading the Israelites through the Red Sea, there's a pillar of cloud which they all follow, and the Lord speaks from the cloud, and eventually the cloud settles on Mount Sinai, and Moses goes up and receives the tablets. So you, know, you have to ask yourself, well, what is this pillar of cloud? Is it a metaphor for something extraterrestrial? When Jesus is baptised, the, the heavens open, the Spirit of God descends like a dove, Jesus gets baptised, and then he's carried off in a cloud into the wilderness. So again, you've got these clouds cropping up all the time. Uh, when, he, when he ascends, after he's died, he ascends into heaven, he ascends on a cloud. Uh, you've also got Ezekiel's vision as well, which many, many of you may know about, where Ezekiel basically describes this sort of strange aerial object emanating lots of light and colour and just looking you know, pretty strange and reading between the lines it does sound a lot like a UFO. I mean the Bible can be interpreted in many ways, um, someone else could read something else in it, but again this, this idea of UFOs are flying around today, they've probably been flying around for thousands of years and I'm sure the skies of Israel and the Middle East weren't exempt several thousand years ago. This is a photo from God Breeze. I mean, it could be a hoax, some people think it's a hoax, but I'm just illustrating the idea of the similarity between what an artist painted several hundred years ago and what people hoax or see today. This is a tapestry from Belgium. It now resides in a church in France. Um, it's a series of five, I remember, if I remember rightly, depicting the life of the Virgin Mary. And quite clearly in the background, you've got a hat or a UFO. Now, you have to ask yourself, you know, these, these things were quite costly to make, quite time consuming. You know, why stick a hat in the back of a, of a tapestry? Um, quite a strange thing to do. So, did the artist have some knowledge of, uh, of, of UFOs? Did he have a sighting? Did the wealthy guy that commissioned the tapestry have a sighting of a UFO. We may never know, but um, fascinating stuff all the same. Here's another one from the same series. Again, you've got, got some UFO-like object in the background. Quite an ambiguous, I think. This is a tapestry from uh, Germany, I believe. It resides in a German gallery. Uh, it depicts uh, King Goski of Gutschermin. There's some Latin in the top of the picture on the border, uh, in the centre, and I've got that translated, and it reads Kingoski of Goskum, and you can see Kingoski in the middle on his cart with all his, uh, his peoples around him. Nice, richly decorative tapestry, and in the background, in the skies, again, you've got these curious UFO-like objects appearing. There's about three on the left-hand side, and there's several on the right-hand side as well. I'm going to enhance them now, so you can see they're there hovering in the background. Now again, what are they? Is the artist trying to depict foreign lands? They're in the sky, could they be UFOs? I'll leave that one up to you. But um, yeah, these, these things do exist. There are, there are a number of tapestries and artworks which have got these uh, sorts of objects in them. I'm sure the uh, 
artistic orthodoxy have got their own viewpoints on what they are, what they depict, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're right. This is a lovely uh, painting from Italy, Montalcino. This was actually Graham Birdsall's favourite image. He was quite interested in my line of research, and uh, this was his favourite artwork. He interviewed me in um, the last issue, which he was editor for, and uh, we discussed this one. This was his favourite image, and uh, you can see up in the sky, and if any of you know about the history of satellites, we have an object which looks remarkably like a uh, Sputnik satellite from the 50s. And on the left hand side, you've got Jesus. You can just see one of the crucifixion marks in his feet. And on the right is God, and in the middle you've got the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And uh, they're grasping this uh, mechanistic like object. It's considered to be a depiction of the earth. And you've got crisscrosses going through the object, which are considered to be the earth's meridians. But at the bottom, bottom uh, left hand side of the object, you've got like an eyepiece. It's almost like a telescope. Interestingly, telescopes weren't invented until 1609 by Galileo, although optics have been around for a few hundred years. But um, quite a strange uh, object to appear in, a, in an ancient painting. There you are, you can see the image as a whole there. So what should you say the antennae were? I'm not sure what the antennae are. I mean, it must, it must be... A, the artist is use, using uh, the antennae as a way of the father and the son um, actually having some grasp on the earth, I guess. What page was that? I think this one is 1598. Wasn't that the um, time when the Pre world thought the earth was flat? Um, well, that's a bit of a misconception, actually. Um, some people thought the earth was flat, but there were some people around the time in the 30th century, certainly, that thought it was round. There is a painting by Sano di Pietro, um, I can't remember the title of it, but it does depict the Earth as, as a spherical round object. Um, so it's a bit of a misconception that everyone thought the Earth was flat. There certainly were a number of people that considered it to be round. Again, religious allegory or something else. I mean, the thing with art is you have this idea of inspiration where you know, the artist gets some sort of inspiration and he paints his image. So. Have, have intelligences been inspiring our artists to paint things that are very mechanistic or UFO-like? It's quite a colourful image, that one. You can see Christ, Christ there is holding, uh, putting his hand on his chest where he's been speared. And you've got some of the uh, blood from the crucifixion. Um, this is an image from a richly illustrated Bible which is held in the Vatican. Um, I don't know anything about St. Jeremiah, so I'm not going to pretend that I do. But just off, the, off to the side here, you've got this curious object. It's not really part of the main scene, but if I enhance it, it's kind of like a fireball with a strange straight line coming off it. It's, it looks quite odd to me. And uh, there's a guy down here who's looking up at the object. It doesn't seem to sort of play any part in the image as a whole, and there isn't a corresponding object like that on the other side of the image. The, the line coming off it so much laser like. It's one of a series of uh, highly decorative images that were done for a, a Bible. They wrote in a lot of artists to do it. And this is one of the images. This is from a piece of furniture from Belgium. It hasn't been on an Antiques Roadshow. And you can see Moses receiving the tablets. And you'll also notice that he's depicted with horns. Now, it's nothing to do with the devil. Um, there are a number of ancient images of Moses with horns. Um, there's a famous statue by Michelangelo which has got Moses with horns. Basically, it's to do with the fact um, that when he was receiving the tablets and there were rays of light shining on him, that phrase, that phraseology was mistranslated as horns for some reason. So what you find is that there are a number of uh, historical images of Moses with horns. But you can see, as he's receiving the tablets off to the left, you, you've got these sort of, sort of like objects in the sky. Um, I'm trying to get a better enhancement of them, but um, yeah, they're there in the sky, hovering, almost like a squadron. I mean, a number of researchers like Reverend Downer that I mentioned earlier, I uh, think there are UFOs in the Bible, 
And when Moses was receiving the tablets from the Lord in the cloud on Mount Sinai, you know, a UFO was involved. So maybe the officers and Whitney painted that there. I've just brought this in. This is a still from Mexico over 1991. You've got a squadron of UFOs that were filmed. There's been a big flag over Mexico since the early 90s. I'm sure many of you know a lot of which taken. Just to illustrate how maybe the artist has captured something back then which we now see today. This is a French miniature from 1453, and you've got this golden ball hovering in the sky. Some people say it's a hot air balloon, but hot air balloons weren't invented for several hundred years more. And you've got a man off to the right who's sort of praying at the object. It's funny how different people interpret objects. I had an email off someone saying, well, that object represents all the ranks of the different angels, the seraphim, the cherubim, and so on. I don't know about that. You see, you'll see the object's got different patterns on it, and there's apparently supposed to represent the different uh, gradients of angels, but aren't there about nine grades of angels? I think there's only about four different uh, patterns on there. This is a fresco from uh, a church in Georgia, a crucifixion scene, and you've got these like saucer -like objects on either side of Christ. There's an enhancement of them. Maybe some form of religious allegory, symbolism. This is a fresco from a church in Kosovo, which fortunately survived the war, still intact. Um, some of you may have seen, this is what we're looking at here. These two objects either side up in the sky. These were published, I think, in the late 60s or early 70s in uh, like an old international book. There's one of them. And there's the other one. It's quite a richly decorated uh, church, this one. There's uh, frescoes all over the walls. And again, you, you've got these uh, flying objects with figures in them. They appear to be at controls. Nice little star or some motif there on that one. He seems to be looking back at the other guy. Looks so their hands are positioned as well. This is the baptism of, baptism of Christ by the Danish artist called Bernard de Gelder, painted in 1710. Got Jesus and, and uh, John the Baptist, Jesus being baptized, and you've got this object appearing in the sky here, shining rays of light down. Now, in the Bible, in the baptism scene, it says the heavens open and the Spirit of God descends like a dove. This is actually a dove here in the middle. Uh, but it doesn't remind me like a UFO. And even if this doesn't depict a UFO, certainly the baptism scene may have involved a UFO, because as I mentioned earlier, of this, uh, this uh, imagery of the heavens opening, the Spirit of God coming down like a dove. Jesus gets baptised and he's carried off into the wilderness. That one is held at the uh, Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, it's on display. This is from uh, a vault in a church in Bulgaria, a theatre in Bulgaria, Pinkney 82. It's entitled To Almighty God. And you can see just off to the right of God's hand. It's our old friend. So it looks like a UFO anyway. Right, that concludes my uh, contentious section on UFOs in religious artwork. I'd hate to show that to like an orthodox religious uh, group. I think they'd probably shoot me. <laughs> What artworks? Yeah. Um, it tends to mainly be Western religious artwork. I've got an example of one from a uh, Tibetan text, and there's some hatchet objects in it. They're, they're in the book. I didn't bring that slide, I've just brought you a sampler. But it tends to be Western religious artwork. I mean, I, you know, there may be examples out there that people haven't discovered or haven't brought to the attention of ufology, you know, that are waiting to be discovered. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I've sort of scoured the vaults as it were and spent a lot of time looking for them and I've come up with what I'm showing you today and what's in my book, but no, no doubt there are other ones out there.
My sectional photographs, um, I like to go before Oswald and Kenneth Arnold because UFOs came into the mainstream in 1947. So obviously, if you got photographs of UFOs prior to that date, they wouldn't have been hoaxed because they wouldn't have known of the concept of UFOs prior to that date. With this example here, uh, I've been able to get in touch with the guy on the horse. He's still alive. Uh, basically, himself and his father went for a ride on their horses one day, a um, lovely sunny day, and the father decided to take a photo of his son. And about 50 years later, uh, the son, obviously he's now an old elderly man, was going through his family album of photographs, and uh, he wanted to scan them, get some nice digital copies, put on a computer, and when he scanned this image, he noticed there was like strange, curious objects above the horse. And when he enhanced it, he saw that. Now, uh, if I just go back to the main image. Um, as I say, first of all, this is before 1947. So, if it was hoaxed, you know, it would have been the first UFO hoax. Didn't know about UFOs in 1945. Or not, you know, not in a sort of normal sense. Um, so if it's not a hoax, what is it? Uh, some people have postulated it's a, a light fitting, but if you look at it carefully, that there's no attachments around the object, it's sort of freestanding. Um, some people think that it is a hoax, but what the cameraman has pointed out, or what the son has said, was that the, um, I think it's at the f-stop marker, the shutter speed was such that if it was an object thrown into the sky, it would have been blurry. But as you can see, the object isn't blurred, so it's, it's just hovering there stationary in the sky. Also as well, uh, you can just see that object there. That is uh, a street lamp. There's a row of buildings behind here, that's a street lamp. So it gives you an idea that the object there is quite high up and quite some way behind the buildings, which, is, which you can just see part of one there. The object wasn't seen at the time. As I said, it was only seen years later when the son was scanning the album. And he actually wants to remain anonymous as well. He doesn't want his name revealed. This one I first saw in about 1980 on a UFO documentary and I was able to get hold of it from Wendell Stevens. He's got quite a large collection of UFO photographs. I suspect many of you have Wendell. He's been around on the UFO scene for quite a few decades. And I think he's got thousands of photographs. And you know, I said, Wendell, have you got any like, early UFO photographs that predate Roswell? So uh, he sent me a few that he had. And uh, the story behind this one is, uh, again, Guy was going through an old family scrapbook of photos and he saw this one and it was then brought to the attention of the UFO community. And the story goes that uh, the guy's father bought it as a souvenir of the place uh, from a street vendor. Apparently one day this object was sighted and the sidewalk photographer took a photo of it. And um, this, this guy's father was able to buy it at a later date. That's Tianjin in China in 1942. Could be a lot, maybe, yeah, but I mean, don't you think it's quite high up? Mm. Oh, I haven't on that one, sorry, no. Could be a lot, yeah. Yeah. Apparently, there are some people looking at the object, but the photo is not clear enough to show that. <laughs> uh, past, I don't know. I don't know what type of camera it's taken with. <laughs> There is, there is an enhancement of it in my book. I can't see any suspension wires around it. It would be nice to get a better copy. No. Yeah. This is a splodgy photo from 1942 of a UFO that was sighted over Los Angeles. Basically, it was wartime. Strange object flies over Los Angeles. Army's wondering what's going on. So these are searchlights. They, they, fight, they put some searchlights on the object. And these are actually auxiliary shells that are going off as the object hovered overhead. It was described as luminous and orange in colour, hovered there for about half an hour. Uh, the auxiliary batteries made no effect at all on the object. It's a bit like that one I showed you from 1600, so from the southern France. Um, now the photo is quite an impressive, but someone managed to get hold of a native of that event. And you can just see the UFO. This photo actually appeared in the Los Angeles Times. Uh, I'm not sure it was on the front cover, if not, it was certainly on one of the inner pages. And uh, this is a negative obtained from the LA Times of the object. Not the witness sighting, it was fired at, hovered there for half an hour. Um, there was a report written by a general on the object, um, it was kept secret for about 30 years. And amongst the, many of the things that were said in there, 
I think about 1,500 uh, rounds of artillery were fired at the object. This one is from 1929. Um, basically the story is, Guy was at the sawmill, he worked at the sawmill, and he wanted to take some photos. And his daughter was with him at the time. And as he was taking a photo, this large, well, they, they, first of all, they heard a really horrible noise. And uh, they saw this object rise up into the sky. And uh, he managed to capture it on camera. Uh, there were other guys working at the sawmill. The sawmill was active that day. Uh, but none of, them, none of the other guys saw the object, but they did feel the ground shudder, and they did hear the noise. But only the guy taking the photo actually, um, you know, captured actually saw it, and his, and his daughter. The daughter's written on their sawmill at Ward, Colorado, April 1929. Now, Fatima. I so, many of you have heard about the Fatima prophecies. The um, story is that three young girls saw an apparition of the Virgin Mary one day, and a number of prophecies were given to the girls, or to one of the girls, I can't remember all of them or one of them. Uh, there were three prophecies given. The first one was uh, the end of World War I and World War II. I think the second prophecy was um, the fall of communism, I believe. Um, the third one, just to look at the debate, but apparently the Vatican said a few years ago that it related to uh, the assassination attempt on Pope John Paul. But what some people don't realise is that a UFO was seen during the Fatima events. Um, after the first meeting with the uh, apparition, the, uh, the, the apparition told the, the children to return every month for six months to that same spot. So word got round. On each of the subsequent occasions, more and more people gathered to witness the events. And fortunately, on the final uh, occasion, 7,000 people were gathered and there was a cameraman present too. And he's taken a photo here of the crowd looking up at the heavens. And basically what happened was on this last event, it had been raining quite heavily, and the rain suddenly stopped, and this large silvery disc object appeared in the sky, emanating a lot of colours, and it dropped down from the sky almost to the ground, and everyone got really scared, and they, they dropped down to the ground naturally, and quite scared, and the thing shot up into the sky. Now, whenever, you, whenever I've seen photos of Fatima, all you ever see are the people on the ground, and you think, well, you know, why didn't the guy take a photo of the UFO? Well, I'm able to get this off Mendel. This is, the, this is what they're actually looking at. I've never seen this published before, anyway. You've got the ground here, there's the sky. And this, this is that, that, that UFO that they were looking at. And it was described as silvery, um, you know, emanating lots of colours, performing manoeuvres. And it's interesting how, you know, all those people saw that object, but due to the fact that it was before the advent of ufology, so as to be classified as a, you know, a religious miracle. People aren't really aware, or don't classify it as a UFO event. And um, I think with Fatima, certainly on this occasion, you have quite an early example of a multiple witness UFO sighting, uh, which was captured on camera. Right, changing the subject slightly. I've shown you a lot of imagery of what appear to be UFOs. Um, and I've touched on the fact earlier that there are a lot of myths and legends of tribes around the world who talk about beings appearing on the sea. Often they've got supernatural powers, they instruct the locals in uh, various fields of science and engineering and then they, they disappear. This is an example from Brazil. This is the, uh, I think they're called the Cabo tribe. And a researcher went there several decades ago, interviewed the tribe, and every so often they celebrate their story of Bet Karoati. And this is their supernatural being. And according to their story, he appeared on the scene one day. He carried a magical staff. You can see the guy's holding some wood here. And um, he was wearing some sort of suit. So to emulate that, the modern day people have dressed, dressed one of their villages in a sort of a bamboo suit. He's holding his staff. Initially, the story goes that the villagers were quite scared of the man. But uh, he soon pacified them. and. Uh, they were quite fascinated by his staff, and he aimed his staff at uh, various objects like trees and rocks, and they all turned to dust. Um, and eventually, I think he married one of the locals and, and produced children, and eventually one day he disappeared. So, I mean, this could be an example of 
ET visitation from, from uh, many centuries ago, maybe not. Um, there are examples from other parts of the world um, of beings having staffs. That's one thing that crops up quite often. Quetzalcoatl, if I remember right, is uh, described as carrying some sort of staff. <coughs> and there are accounts of uh, beings today holding staffs or pencil-like objects which can uh, carry out certain functions. When you get these cross correspondences occurring in different tribes around the world of these you know, supernatural beings, and you know, couple together with all the accounts of UFOs and strange beings, it does make you wonder whether maybe you know, a small percent of them may well be genuine. So, here are my conclusions. I think there's a plethora of evidence throughout history, both illustrating and written of UFO visitation. I've only touched on a small sample today. Many of the world's religions and tribal beliefs talk of being sent from the sky and instructing mankind. <coughs> And I suppose my basic sort of hypothesis is, my basic statement is that UFO visitation occurs today, and therefore, logically speaking, would have occurred for millennia. One of the speakers earlier talked about stigmata and ghosts occurring today and having an historical component. St. Francis of Assisi was a stigmatic. Um, it seems to me if something has, if something's tangible and occurs, it will have an historical component. And I think UFOs are one of those, those things, along with many other psychic phenomena. So, thank you for listening to me. Questions? Yep, uh, thanks, Matthew. Uh, are you going to answer questions? Yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Can you hear me okay? This doesn't seem to be working fine. Uh, can you please raise your hand if you've got any questions? Yep, at the back, I'll come up. Um, whilst I'm walking up, Matthew is doing a book signing. Um, in another five minutes' time outside here. Uh, so, if you do want to buy these books, he's willing to sign, so yeah, that's it. What's the hand? Thank you. I was just wondering, Matt, if you've seen the, um, the depictions in the Red Bay Chateau, <coughs> in the church there, of the um, fantastic. Looks like motherships above Jesus' head. No, I haven't seen that actually. No. Absolutely astonishing. You have to send me those then. <laughs> it looks amazing. I'll be set on that one. <coughs> I don't think it's. Is it, can you hear me on that microphone? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Just on one of the tapestries, um, yeah. the shapes look a bit like clouds. I think it was the. Um, Belgian country. The Belgian one, yeah. I mean, I may be wrong. Yeah. But maybe. I'm just saying. Could maybe. Be, yeah. um, I'd just like to say that um, when I was in Japan, um, I saw a stone UFO at one of the temple shrines. It, it was fairly big, it was calmed down, and it was a you know, very conventional, traditional shaped UFO. I don't know what it was supposed to be said. Um, uh, my visit was very fleeting at the time, so I couldn't examine the problem. But it was fairly large, about as large as a millstone. Yeah. I mean, even if you take away all the artistic accounts of UFOs, you're still left with many written accounts of them. But the two go hand in hand quite well. Jeremiah's one of yours. Did you notice that um, the, the, there was an angel floating, lots of things floating, and the main character was also in the bubble. Yeah. He was up in the air. So I think yeah. you know, they depict a lot of things in the air. And also, they're trying to portray emotions quite a lot, so I'd mm. imagine they'd have to have that. Um, yeah, there was just a few things I'd like to ask. Yeah, that's a good point. Any other questions at all? Could, once again, ladies and gentlemen, can you please give uh, your appreciation to Matthew, who will be so his Before we uh, depart for a 15-minute break, um, there's a lot of people working behind the scenes today, uh, Steve Begley, uh, Richard Conway, but uh, one man's doing all the lights, all the audio, absolutely everything. Without him today, we'd run so smoothly. So can you please give your appreciation to Matthew Williams, who's been here. Thank you. And lastly, there was one person involved, 